Hi, and welcome to today's webinar on making the most out of your clinical appointments. Before we dive in, I would like to make a couple of announcements. We provide this free webinar series so that you have access to this information no matter where you may be listening in from. We host several webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current schedule for 2018. Simply go to our website at www.johnson-center.org and click on the webinars link on the right-hand side. New webinars and events are added often, so if you're not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the homepage. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and special events and presentations there. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash the Johnson Center, where you will find a library of our several of several of our past webinars covering a wide variety of topics. For those of you who are in Austin or nearby, be sure to follow our so social media pages for upcoming announcements about summer camps and classes, our April Teddy Bear Clinic, a fun online auction, and a special announcement for new grants and scholarships for diagnostic and counseling services. And be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative, and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes, or look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It will contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have questions during the live webinar, you may type them into your GoToWebinar control panel. If you are watching a recording of this webinar, you may email questions to the presenter at info at johnson-center.org. So let's get started. Today's webinar was prepared by Gina Hill and Morgan Devlin. Morgan is an invaluable research assistant here at the Johnson Center. She is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin where she received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology. She spends most of her time here working closely with patients and their families, assisting them with their participation in our ongoing research studies. Gina is a certified child life specialist and is the family care coordinator here at the Johnson Center where she has coordinated comprehensive care programs for families for almost seven years. Gina's commitment to helping families find the resources and supports they need is second to none, and her focus in developing sibling support programs, medical play programs to help children deal with anxiety and fears related to medical care, and inclusive social skills opportunities for children with developmental disorders or chronic health issues has helped hundreds of children and families. Please welcome your presenter, Gina Hill. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We will be discussing some helpful tips on how to make the most out of your clinical appointments. If you are listening in today as a parent, a patient, or a healthcare provider, I hope that you take away some valuable lessons in organization and time management. We will be discussing some helpful ways to prepare for your appointments, questions to ask during your visit, and how important it is to follow up with your clinician. We will also be talking about some strategies that you can put in place to address outside factors such as travel, which can impact your appointment time. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we'll be discussing some strategies on how to make the most out of your clinical appointments. When we talk about clinical appointments, we are referring to all consultations, including appointments with your general practitioner, your therapist, your dietitian, et cetera. We'll be discussing ways that families can prepare and organize their communication with all healthcare providers. Many of our patients and families have developed and discussed ways that help them navigate through their appointment visits. <clears throat> For continuity of care, it's important to gather, maintain, and communicate any progress notes, any questions that you have, and recommendations that affect your child's treatment or your treatment. For some families or patients, this may mean creating a binder of information or working on creating a spreadsheet to keep track of up-to-date information. For other families, this may mean just building communication between your healthcare providers. Feeling confident in your communication with your practitioner takes some care and planning. Preparing for your visits can help you communicate your concerns more effectively. So first, let's think through what do you want to get out of your appointment? Are you looking for a new diagnosis, a new treatment recommendation, 
or are you looking for answers to current symptoms? It's important to have a clear idea of what your goal is for your appointment. Next, consider why are you going to see the doctor? Is this a chronic or a new issue? Are you open to various treatment recommendations? Or are you seeking confirmation and implementation of a specific treatment? You can then consider what do you hope that the doctor will do for you? Are you looking for someone who will provide continued care? Answering questions like these in advance can help you clearly communicate to your doctor what you expect from your visit. So when thinking about what you want to get out of your appointment, ask yourself if you need more information about your current diagnosis or your symptoms. For example, what is the condition? And how serious is my condition? And how will it affect my home and work life? Is it short term or long term? What causes the condition? Is there more than one condition that could be causing my symptoms? And should I be tested for similar conditions? What symptoms should I watch out for? And how can I be tested for this condition and what will those tests tell me? You can ask yourself what tests will be involved in diagnosing and how safe and accurate are those tests. You can also ask yourself when you will need to know the test results and if you would need to consider additional testing. Thinking further along, you can ask yourself if you will need a follow-up visit and if so, how often? And how is your condition typically treated? So think about what information your doctor will need in advance. Most providers will ask you if you are currently taking any medication. So it's a good idea to prepare a medication list in advance or plan on bringing your medications with you to your visit. It helps you get organized and it helps the doctor or physician understand what you're taking. For example, your physician may not know that another doctor has started you on a new medication. So you should include the names of the medications, the dosages, and the schedule of when you take these medications and provide them to all practitioners. You should also include any vitamins, supplements, or over-the-counter medicines that you are taking. If you have a new diagnosis and are currently not on any medication, you can consider the following questions. What are my treatment options? How long will treatment take? And the cost of that treatment? What treatment is most common? And is there a generic form of treatment and is it effective? Any side effects that you can expect? Risks and benefits associated with the treatment? And consider what would happen if I didn't have the treatment? You can also think about if there's anything that you should avoid during treatment and what you should do if you do have side effects. And if you're tracking your symptoms, you can also consider how will I know if the medication is working? What would I do if I miss a dose or medication? And will my job or lifestyle be affected? So I know these are a lot of questions to consider. And you can also consider asking yourself if you're seeking information about your current symptoms, think through your symptoms in details and be specific. For example, when you're talking to your doctor about your symptoms, you can start by saying, my chest hurts. But if you're really specific about what your symptoms are, this can help narrow down potential health problems of which tests and medications that your healthcare provider is prescribing. So for example, instead of saying my chest hurts, you can explain that my chest hurts when I walk up the stairs or my chest hurts when I eat spicy foods. This is a much clearer description of the problem. Also, don't forget to state how long you've had these symptoms and how long they typically last when you have them and if they last during a memorable event, such as a fall or a car accident, and if these things might have triggered. So planning all of this information in advance and answering all of these questions that we've talked about is really vital in planning for your visit. So speaking of planning, it's important to think through the details of the visit. This is especially true for parents. Taking a child to a doctor can sometimes be really challenging, especially if you have multiple children. If you want to make the most out of your visits, plan accordingly. 
For example, you can take an appointment survival kit with you. This could include one or two favorite small toys, a book, some favorite music, or a favorite program on a handheld device. You can include snacks and a drink, and you can use this strategy during your appointment to distract your child and help them feel more comfortable. You can also use a visual timer. Visual timers can help children understand how long they'll be waiting. These timers show how much time has passed. You can buy timers or even use a smartphone app, but sometimes waiting for the general practitioner or a dentist can be unpredictable, so you really wanna be careful before you use this type of strategy. You can also consider asking for accommodations. For example, if your child is more comfortable with your touch versus that of a doctor or a nurse, ask them if they can show you how to do the procedures or if you can help them do the procedures. Also, some children prefer to stand rather than sit during an exam. And if that's true for your child, you can ask whether the doctor or the nurse can do some of the procedures while they're standing. And if they need a shot, request a numbing cream to make it less painful. So all of those accommodations can be helpful when trying to prepare and plan for your visits. You can also ask in advance about the services of a child life specialist. Child life specialists help children cope through the stresses of medical procedures. If your child's doctor is affiliated with a hospital or another large medical facility, they may be able to request a child life specialist support during your child's visit. It's also important to learn the layout. You can call ahead or even better, drop in at your own pre, for your own pre-appointment and visit to get a feeling for the layout in the building and the rooms. You can also become more familiar with the procedures and what to expect and other interactions that will include your child. A little familiarity can help you develop a plan to direct your child from beginning to end with a minimum of unpleasant surprises. If your child is really resistant or feel fearful, you can try taking it one small step at a time. For instance, if they resist so much that entering the building is hard, you might start by explaining that the two of you will simply sit in a car in the parking lot for a brief time before leaving. Remember to reward and pra praise each small success and then gradually build on it. For example, the next visit, you might propose that the two of you step into the building. On subsequent visits, you might stay a little bit longer and move up to the hallway or towards the doctor's office. You can also practice doing some medical play. The aim here is to help your child become more comfortable with the procedures and medical equipment used in the exams or procedures. So for example, if your child has been resistant before to being examined with a stethoscope, you might wanna use a toy stethoscope in a game of pretend at home. Again, gradual step-by-step -step exposure tends to be best. So you could start by showing the stethoscope to your child and then inviting them to touch the stethoscope. You might show how it's used on yourself or a doll or stuffed animal. And then you can invite them to use it to examine you or the doll or the stuffed animal. You wanna be sure that you wait until they're receptive to this before asking them to use it. <clears throat> a lot of our families have made use of social stories to help guide them through the appointment times and the visits. Through pictures and simple language, visual stories can make potentially difficult situations more predictable and provide children with coping strategies. You can also practice relaxation techniques. So depending on your child's abilities, consider teaching them some relaxation techniques that can prompt them to be used in stressful situations. So some of these that we recommend when we say relaxation techniques are some deep breathing. So in a calm and private place, you can practice slowly inhaling and exhaling, or you can just ask them to practice blowing up a balloon or blowing bubbles to get them to have that sense of calmness. You can also use visualization or some guided imagery. If they are receptive, you can try encouraging your child to close their eyes and imagine a, a favorite or a safe place. So inviting them to imagine sights, sounds, and smells that they are familiar with that help maintain a positive atmosphere can help them to provide a technique that they are safe, that they are in a familiar place, um, and that they are really in control of the situation. So we've talked about some tips to help parents um, 
help their child go to a doctor's visit or a provider's visit, let's talk about if you're coming in as a patient yourself and what you can do to better prepare and plan for that appointment. So the first thing that you can do is think about the timing of your appointment as well as the cost. There's no perfect day to schedule, but Mondays are typically a day to avoid. In other words, if there are any other day that works, avoid Mondays at all costs. You can minimize your wait time by asking for the first appointment of the morning or the afternoon immediately following the office lunch break. Another way to reduce potential stressful waiting time is to call ahead and ask if the doctor is on schedule. You might do this before you leave home or you can do this before you get out of your car in the parking lot. If appointments are running behind as they typically do, ask the staff if they can call you shortly before the provider is ready to see you or your child. This is really helpful if you are a parent and you know that your child is stressed. You want a better plan for that um, and expect a good wait time. It's also really important um, if you're coming in as a patient yourself to think about your own financial responsibility. Will your appointment be billed through your insurance or private pay? Is your provider in network or out of network? Are you prepared to pay a copay? And if so, are you planning on charging it to a debit credit card or using a health savings account? These are all really important factors to consider as different clinics offer a variety of different payment options. If you are under financial constraints, you should also consider asking if there are payment plans, scholarships, or grants available. Expenses are never a happy surprise, so plan in advance to make it less scary. Here are some general questions to consider when thinking about your own financial responsibility. Is this treatment necessary and how much will be covered by my health insurance? If everything is not covered, approximately how much money will I need to pay? If my insurance does cover the tests and procedures, what is my copay? And is there an alternative test, drug, or procedure that could be more cost effective? Another helpful tip that you should consider if you're coming in either as a patient yourself or a parent, you should consider the location of the appointment and travel times when scheduling your visit. If you are scheduled during high traffic times, plan on getting there early. You should also be considerate of the appointment time. For example, appointments typically run late, so try not to plan during a lunch break or a time when you know that you have an upcoming appointment. This means you will likely be pressed for time and you may possibly forget questions to ask your clinician or be distracted once you're in your visit. If you are traveling from out of town for your visit, you should also consider breaks. Does your schedule allow you for time to eat? If not, plan on bringing food with you. Are you familiar with the location and with parking? If not, looking into getting information on that in advance. If you're traveling from out of town, how far is the hotel from the clinic? Would you have to go back to your hotel if needed to check out? You want to be sure that you have all of those travel arrangements put in place so that you are not distracted or feel pressured to leave during your visit due to outside factors. All of these tips can save you considerable time and stress, which overall helps you concentrate on your visit. For parents that are tuning in today, this one's for you. You should really plan on additional caregiver support. It's always helpful to have support with you when you go to your appointments. The person who accompanies you can serve as a second set of ears, and they may be able to think about questions to ask your doctor or remember details about your symptoms or treatment that you may have forgotten. You can plan on bringing someone with you to help in the case of childcare. So for many parents, having an hour-long conversation with your healthcare provider can be almost impossible with a young child present. So consider bringing another family member or friend to help distract your child so that you can take notes during your visit and remember, ask questions. It may also be beneficial to think about asking for help from support staff. Talk to your nurse ahead of time regarding the concerns for having a child present during the visit. You may want to confirm if it's even required that your child come to every visit or if the clinic has available childcare. Your team members are there to assist you, so remember to ask for help. Talking to your clinician regarding your child's needs before you go can help the professional 
be better prepared and be able to provide a good service for your child. If the professional doesn't want to talk to you beforehand, it's okay to choose someone different. It can help to ask a professional who's had experience with children with additional needs. So explaining any sensory sensitivities that your child has can be helpful to that person in advance. If your child has trouble understanding what people say, you can also mention this too. For example, you might say, it often helps if one person speaks at a time, slowly and clearly, using simple, soft, calm language to a nurse or a healthcare provider to help them better communicate with your child. So let's say that you are prepared for your appointment and you have created a plan. Now let's make sure all of your questions and concerns are organized in a way that is useful for your clinician to interpret. Many clinics require information in advance. They may request a record or ask you to fill out and or submit certain forms. So having all of this information organized and ready to go will make the most out of your time. Filling out all of those medical forms can be very overwhelming. With the multiple appointments to keep up with and all of the notes and recommendations that each clinician provides, it's no wonder that we have a hard time implementing treatment. Think about creating templates to keep track of all of your appointments. You can actually find some great templates online and print those to create a binder of information for you or your child. This could be especially important if you or your child has a chronic illness. For these patients, documenting and tracking progress is significant information for a provider. These templates can provide you with a starting point of how to organize information and gather it in a way that can be helpful during your next visit. Many times, clinics will ask for this information in their new patient or follow-up paperwork, so having a template that you can easily refer back to can save you time and stress of not having to track down all of this information right before your appointment. And almost every appointment will ask for a detailed medical history. With information like this that stays consistent, it's even more convenient to have it located in one document. With multiple appointments, you may also receive a wealth of information from doctor's notes to lab results. So a binder can help organize this information for you so that you can easily refer back to. You may also want to create a spreadsheet for prescriptions or supplement schedules. This can make it easier to track a dosage or track frequency. It all may seem like a tedious task to organize this information, but in the end, it not only saves you time filling out all of those forms, but also to make the most out of your appointment time and make it most effective. You could also get creative and keep a healthcare journal to track and monitor changes of your symptoms and treatment. This can be extremely valuable for a new physician to review. There are many health journals that you can find online. For example, there are numerous food journals that help you track your calories and document how your body is responding. There are also several apps that you can download on your phone that allow you to track and monitor your health. So you can use the same idea to track other forms of treatment and therapy. For example, you can create a template or use an app that helps you track your vitamins, supplements, and medication. You should include the date started and date stopped and the reason for stopping. This is so important. You may feel like a certain supplement or a medication is having adverse effects or may not be working at all, so you just stop the medication altogether. Without knowing the date of when you stopped, your practitioner is unaware of any reactions or responses that could happen. If you provide this information during your appointment, your physician is able to monitor and track reactions that may be due to medication changes. It's also important that along with your health journal, you bring in copies of current lab results or notes from other providers outlining current treatment recommendations. We'll go into this a little bit later on, but this helps to provide consistency and continuity of care. If you or your child has a chronic illness, you may feel like you need to bring in the entire medical history, but most of the time physicians will only ask for the last 12 to 18 months. So remember to bring in the most current and up-to-date results. And here's the most important lesson for today is to remember to ask questions. Your practitioner will likely ask you to fill out many forms and ask you multiple questions in advance. As you answer these questions, don't be afraid to ask your own. 
In the upcoming slides, we'll provide examples of common questions patients and families are asked and questions that you should think about that you should be prepared to ask yourself. So anticipate what the doctors will ask and be honest with your answers. Speak up. Don't understate your symptoms. Your doctors only know what you tell them. Leaving out details and not answering questions truthfully can actually hinder your health care and in some cases may have serious consequences. So while it can be difficult to talk about some personal health concerns, a doctor who doesn't fully understand a patient's problem cannot effectively help you. Don't let embarrassment stand in the way of the care that you need. So here are some examples of standard questions to think about. When did the symptoms start? Is this a new symptom or has it happened before? Did anything trigger it? Is it present every day or does it come and go? Is it worse in the morning, as the day goes on or at night? And does it interfere with your daily routine? And if the symptom is causing you pain, how severe is the pain? Also consider what additional information your doctor may need. As patients, we often feel like we spend so much time repeating ourselves to different providers, and we may forget what symptoms they know and what symptoms are new. I wanted to take some time to really talk about how we should appreciate all of those questions that are asked of us and really take time in answering, even though it can be a pretty frustrating task. Every patient is different, and although we may have seen the same doctor over several years, Documenting this information only protects us. It serves as a way to make our care individualized and our treatment more effective. We may want to skim through this information or even skip through some of the parts, but that's really only a detriment to ourselves. The first lesson in making the most out of your appointments is making the most out of the information you provide to your physician. So be sure to check in with your clinic and see if they have a patient portal and review any forms you need to fill out in advance. <clears throat> Here on the current slide is an example of a form that we use, which is our nutrient intake analysis. This information helps us to identify the child's current nutritional status. There are many specific questions on this form, including a child's height and weight, as well as specifics on serving size and meal specifications, including how is the meal prepared. All of this information allows us to provide appropriate and accurate treatment recommendations. However, as you can see on this sample, many times we receive forms that are missing those vital pieces of information. So for example, documenting drinks milk three times a day that's a lot different than saying drinks eight ounces of 2% milk fortified with A and D vitamins three times a day. So just be as detailed and specific as possible. The more detailed, the more specific your recommendations can be. So the big day, the day of your appointment, you've spent time preparing and planning for your appointment. You've created a detailed health care journal and you have all of your list of questions ready. You've blocked off your schedule so you aren't pressed for time, and you have obtained a parking pass so you know exactly where you're going. Now what? Well, here are just a few other tidbits to remember for the day of the appointment. Although you have probably already submitted this information online, be prepared to show up early to fill out any necessary paperwork. There is always something that the office will need. Remember, bring in copies of your license, insurance and credit card, or your health savings account card. Plan on bringing something to take notes, or remember to ask for notes after your visit. And remember, if you need assistance, call ahead. If you are bringing your child in for a doctor's visit, it is a good idea for parents and providers to discuss a backup plan at the start of the appointment to determine when to stop a procedure or when to call in for more assistance. Providers should know the goals of the visit and prioritize necessary objectives, such as lab work, to make appointments run smoothly. If the care team observes increasing agitation in a patient, they can, they can consider whether the results of the procedure or the visit are urgent or critical enough and discuss whether the family should proceed. 
Providers can explain what they're doing before that they do it to reduce any uncertainty and encourage the patient's understanding of the procedure. Providers, you should use simple direct communication when talking to a child and supplement this with any visual supports necessary. To get the most out of your visit, you can use rewards and reinforcements as the child moves from routine procedures such as vital checks to blood draws. And as a parent, you know what motivates your child, so communicate that to your provider. You can make sure you get the best possible care by being an active member of your healthcare team during your appointment. Being involved means being prepared and asking questions. Taking steps before your medical appointment will help you to make the most out of your time and out of the most out of your team members' time. Asking questions about your diagnosis, treatment, medications can only improve the quality, safety, and effectiveness of your healthcare. So you can refer back to the list of prepared questions that we had for your doctor. This will save you some time in trying to think of things on the spot or possibly forgetting to bring something up. I know oftentimes I get so lost in note taking during my appointments that I forget to ask some of the questions that I had and then end up trying to call the office to get that information later on. Keeping yourself organized makes all of the difference. So again, just having those list of questions prepared and referring back to them can really help during your appointment. We talked a little bit about some questions to have in advance if you need any help with any more. Some, question, some other questions to consider are questions about the testing. What's the test for? How many times has this provider or clinic done this test? And when would you get the results? If you have any questions about medication or supplements, you can ask specifics like, how do you spell that name of the drug? So you can look more into it. You can ask if there are any side effects of the medication and if the medication will interact with any current medications that you're taking. If you have just been recommended a treatment, you can ask about the type of treatment and if there are any alternatives and if there are any complications that you should be aware of. So we've talked a lot about being an active team member, asking questions, getting that information from your provider. Um, really the best possible way to get the most out of your appointment is just to have open dialogue and communication between you and you or your child's provider. And one way to do this is through patient and family-centered care. So we'll review a little bit about what patient family-centered care is. According to the Institute of Family-Centered Care, Patient and family centered care is an approach to the planning, delivery, and evaluation of healthcare that encourage partnerships between patients, families, and providers. There are four core principles, including dignity and respect, which means that healthcare providers must listen to and honor patient and family perspective and choices. There's information sharing, which is the second principle that means that healthcare providers communicate and share complete and unbiased information with patients and families in ways that are affirming and useful. Participation is the third principle, and this means that patients and families are encouraged and supported in participating in care and decision making. The last principle is collaboration. Patients, families, and providers should collaborate in policy and program development, in implementation, and in assessment. There are also some core components of patient and family-centered care that can increase communication with your practitioner and help you make the most out of your appointments. There are some listed here, including there should be respect for patients' values, preferences, and expressed needs. There should be information and education. In some interviews, patients expressed that they were worried that they were not being completely informed. So make sure that you have complete information and education on your current clinical status in, in your care and in any, any other recommendations that could be considered for your child or your treatment. You should also include the involvement of friends and families. And this principle addresses how important the role of those family and friends are in a patient's experience. There's also continuity and transition. In another survey, patients expressed concern about their ability to care for themselves after they left their visit. 
So meeting patients' needs in this area requires an understandable and detailed information plan regarding any medications or limitations and coordinating and planning those ongoing treatment and services after the patient has left. A provider should also be prepared to provide information regarding access to continued treatment and any financial support for those appointments. I can't stress enough how important it is to be present during your appointment. Limit distractions and turn off your phone. If you have scheduled your appointments accordingly and you hopefully will not have to worry about childcare or getting back to work or any other distractions, it's important for you to really be present during that visit. It's also important to repeat back what you hear so that you have better understanding. If you are note taking, refer back to recommendations for clarification. Remember, Patient and family-centered care, you're an active team member and you are your child's treatment, so be present and stay involved. To be involved in your health care, you can take part in all decisions about your treatment. You can share any special care needs that you have. You can, again, ask a, trust, ask a trusted family member or friend to accompany you when you have your visit. You can remember that you are the center of that healthcare team. You have the information necessary to make those important treatment recommendations. Communication is a two-way street. Once you've provided information to your doctor, it's time to listen up. The more you understand about your own healthcare, the more that you are in control. So it's critical that you understand what you've been diagnosed with, what treatment options your doctor is re recommending and why, and what the possible outcomes are. Whether you've been seeing your doctor for years or seeing a new doctor for the first time, effective communication can help build a solid, effective partnership that results in positive healthcare outcomes. I also want to talk a little bit about scheduling those follow-up appointments and how to create a follow-up treatment plan. So you've had the consult with your physician or your doctor and now you want to look at treatment recommendations. What do you do after those recommendations are put in place? How do you let your practitioner know how you're doing? The first thing is to discuss with them what next steps would be. So ask, what should I do before my next visit? Rather than seeing doctor, uh, doctor's appointment as isolated moments in time, try to view them as goalposts or milestones. Ask your doctor what you can work on before your next visit. That way, you'll have the right guidance on what you need to be doing in the meantime. And think logistics. When do I need to see my doctor again? And what would the cost be? Don't assume you need to wait a year or longer to follow up. Ask if they have any recommendations on the time frame of when to follow up or schedule that visit. Many times, follow-up visits are shorter than a new patient appointment, so be sure to ask to confirm if the cost will be the same over time. Also, consider asking your insurance if you have any specific requirements on what they cover. For example, your insurance may only cover office visits, so be sure if you're aware of your coverage before you schedule a phone consult. Also, consider your deductible as well as your HSA when scheduling a follow-up appointment. Again, referring back to what we talked about earlier, you should also consider those travel accommodations. For those families that travel, be mindful of booking those hotel rooms in advance. You should also let your clinician know that you may need to confirm your follow-up appointments well in advance so you have enough time to plan for those accommodations. And be sure to request your notes or labs. Know that you have a right to obtain your re medical records. If you need to refer back to recommendations that were given or you're just curious about any test results you have, you have the right to request that information directly. After your appointment, the best advice would be to implement any recommendations given and check in with your nurse providing feedback on how that intervention is going. Don't wait to start recommendations. Once you have started treatment recommendations, remember, track your intervention. You may want to keep a log of when you started treatment and how you felt. Again, you can refer back to your health journal or your apps to track your health care. Not only will this help your provider stay up to date with changes, but you'll feel more connected and part of the experience. As mentioned before, you're a valuable team member in your child's treatment or your treatment, and this is one way to be active. Take control of the data.
Your healthcare provider is not with you or your family 24 seven. So you have the prime opportunity to be able to monitor, record and track information that can be pertinent in the treatment planning process. If the treatment is having adverse effects or if you feel like it's not working, you have the data that supports that. On the other hand, if you start noticing positive changes, you can also look back and observe when those changes took place and identify what intervention was working at the time. Providing your doctor with good and accurate information about your symptoms and medications can be the necessary tools to accurately diagnose your condition and prescribe appropriate treatment. A list of medications and supplements you are taking, recent symptoms and the dates at which they occurred, and any recent tests name of other doctors you are seeing can all be helpful useful, and useful information to share with your doctor. The better you communicate your needs, the better your doctor can respond. Referring back back to how important it is to follow up with your physician. So you have a plan of what you should be doing. You're tracking that information. Now you want to schedule, you want to follow up. So after you meet with your doctor, you need to follow the instructions to keep track of your health. Your doctor may also fill a prescription or make another appointment for tests, labs, or follow-up visits. So it's important that you clarify all of those different recommendations. It's also important to call your doctor if you're unclear about any instructions that have been given. So create a list of follow-up questions. If you had a healthcare problem, what do you do? If you need to change or refill a prescription, what are the steps that you need to take? Other times to notify your provider is if you're having side effects or if your symptoms get worse. You should also be prepared to get your test results that way that you can review that and share that information with any other provider that you are working with. Your questions help your doctor and healthcare team learn more about you, and your doctor's answers to your questions can help you make better decisions and receive a higher level of care. So remember to just keep constant communication open, and if you have any questions, reach out to your nurse or reach out to your provider. Your questions can lead to better results for your health. And this kind of goes along with what we've been saying, taking control of your treatment, planning your follow-up care, really being in control of you or your child's treatment is really important. Your relationship doesn't leave or doesn't end when you leave the office. It continues. So here are some helpful tips to make sure that you have that open communication and you're following up with your appointments. Again, continue your treatment recommendation as planned, updating your medical binder so that you have that ready. You have that information prepared in advance so that you can discuss that during your next visit. Find any of the results of the tests that you've had. The doctor's office should call you, but if you don't hear from them in a week or two, call them yourself. If you've signed up for a patient online system, go online and check for your results. Be active. Be a part of this experience and take control. Remember to refill or fill your prescriptions. Be sure to follow the directions on the prescription bottle or pack. And if you're unsure, call the pharmacist or call your doctor's office. Don't just stop or don't just not start treatment because you have questions. Talk to your practitioner. When you go to the pharmacy, ask if your prescription is covered by your health plan. If it's not covered, call your doctor's office and ask if there is similar medication that can be prescribed. So you want to be able to, if you are ever provided with a challenge or a barrier, consider going back to the clinic, going back to your provider to try and figure out an alternative recommendation. You know, you really want to be able to start any recommendation. So if there's anything that's hindering that, just be honest about it and figure out another alternative. Good communication with your healthcare provider will keep your relationship strong and ensure that you get the best possible care. So by staying in touch and sharing information, you'll build a solid connection between you and your provider and you and your family. If you're scheduled for a follow-up visit, be sure and ask if, there, if there's any information that you will need to provide in advance. This gets you back to thinking about that healthcare journal or that binder of information. You already have that ready, and if they need anything specific, you can refer back to it. If you feel like communication isn't working, try asking for what you need and advocating for more communication. It's so important to have that open dialogue and stay connected to your healthcare team. Don't be shy about following up with your concerns. If you still feel like team members aren't responding, 
then maybe try calling the office directly or try contacting a different team member. And remember, if you try your best and still don't feel like your efforts or concerns are being met, it may always be worth it to look for a second opinion. I want to briefly talk about collaborative care because as we've talked about preparing and planning for your office appointments and what you can do to take control and be an active team member, it's also so important that those relationships really bridge between all of your different providers. If you're working with different people and getting different treatment recommendations and you're really confused about what to start and what not to start, the best thing that you can do is just make sure that everyone is on the same page and you are receiving a really comprehensive treatment plan. Everybody knows what you or your child is doing. Everybody's on the same page in terms of what the goal is. So if you're working with several healthcare providers, you're likely involved in a multidisciplinary team and they're treating you or your child through a specific scope of, uh, scope of practice. So together, they can be able to provide you with a treatment plan that is more informed if they have information from you on what's been given to you by other people. The beauty of a collaborative care effort is that you have a team of people that may be able to answer your questions or concerns. So seeking advice, help, or guidance can be helpful to navigate if you have a trusting team and a supportive team of people ready to offer you their guidance. Use your resources and talk to your provider. If you are interested in additional therapies or interventions, they likely have a referral list and can guide you to those services that would match your needs. Don't be afraid to talk to your provider about different interventions if you're looking into it. In fact, it's important to be honest and open. Many times, those interventions may complement one another, such as dietary intervention and behavioral therapy. It might be helpful to find providers that are well-versed in multiple treatments and can follow your plan accordingly. It's also easier to work with multiple providers if you have relationships with one another. This is a unique benefit at the Johnson Center. Here, we provide treatment through multiple scopes of practice and we're able to complement those treatments by working as a team. So you really wanna build that unity. And if you're working with different providers from different clinics or different agencies, the best way to do that is to provide them with any feedback, referrals, recommendations, notes, so that everybody is aware of up-to-date treatment recommendations. In reviewing this information, the message that we really hope our patients and parents take away is how important and valuable you are to you or your child's treatment. This is especially true for parents. While you may be working with multiple specialists, you are your child's expert. You have all the knowledge that providers need to make informed decisions. Your input, your questions, and your suggestions should not go unnoticed. In sum, the best way to build a relationship with your provider and make the most out of your appointment is to be actively engaged and part of the treatment planning process. So I just wanna review a couple of things. Don't be afraid to speak up and ask questions. Let your doctor know how you learn best so that you can receive information in your learning style. Schedule appointment times for first thing in the morning or right after lunch, as the waiting times would likely be shorter. Arrive early in case you need to update any forms. Ask for doctor's recommendations for websites for additional information or learn, le to learn more about your condition. Know what symptoms you should be aware of and what might indicate the condition is worsening or when to give the office a call. And be sure any specialist you see has updates on the primary physician who oversees your overall health. If you think of additional questions after your appointment, remember, call the office, check in with your nurse, ask questions. And remember to keep all of your list of questions, all of the recommendations, notes, reports, all organized in one place so that you can easily refer back to if needed. I know this was a lot of information. I want to just be briefly provide you with our resource list. Um, you can go through these. Um, a lot of these are just blogs, some written by healthcare providers themselves on what they recommend for their patients. Um, it's really important to just be mindful of information that you receive out there. Every child is different. Every patient is different. So really think about you or your child's treatment and what would work best for you. I also want to take some time right now to answer, answer a couple of questions. We do have a couple more minutes before wrapping up. So if you 
can think of anything or if you'd like to ask us any questions, feel free. So we have a great question here. For adults with developmental disabilities, including autism, is there any counterpart akin to a child life specialist who may continue to be needed well into adult years? Um, so a child life specialist role is to really help provide support during a medical visit. And a lot of those strategies can be modified to various populations. Um, it might depend on the level of functioning of the adult, but things like planning ahead, a visual schedule, while it might not be a social story, that type of thing can really help. Um, a lot of times what we see working as a child life specialist, um, you really want to assess what the fear is or what the stress is related to the experience. Uh, most often it is the unexpected, so not knowing what to expect from the visit, um, being surprised by procedures like unexpected testing or blood draws that would have to happen. So some of the strategies that we talked about today um, can be modified for an older population, just calling ahead, making sure that you have an outline of the steps um, that you'll be doing. A lot of other um, support strategies that we put in place when the stress isn't because of unexpected events. Um, it may be related more towards fear of pain or um, fear of the unknown for a procedure. So a lot of times maybe distraction can help or pain management. So you always want to ask for the option of a numbing cream if you're going to be doing a procedure such as a blood draw. Um, a lot of times, even with adults, we have preferred interest or activities. So it may just be helpful to bring in a preferred item. Um, you can download videos on your phone. You can have Netflix ready for you. And that might be what you need to help support an older individual on the spectrum. Um, also, again, referring back to the level of functioning, it's also really helpful, and this is true for all developmental areas, um, if you provide some form of independence or control. So helping that individual with autism, um, helping them create a support system so if they want to choose what to do during that visit, you can provide them with options. You can watch a movie, you can play a game, you can read a book, which would you like to do? And if they say they want to play on their phone, then allow them to do that. So you've already created a support system, you've had strategies, and now you're just letting them choose what options so that they have some independence. And that's really validating for an older individual with autism. Um, and so that could be one option that you do. So uh, that was a great question. I hope I answered that. Um, I would really just look into child life support strategies. We have a, um, a template on our website that you can refer to that you might be able to modify and accommodate to fit that person's individual needs. So we have another question here. What would you recommend if you know that your doctor is not supportive about a special therapy type such as ABA for early intervention on autism toddlers? So I'm going to kind of generalize this a little bit to what do you do if your healthcare provider is not supportive of other interventions that you're currently doing? And I think the best thing there is going back to our slide on collaborative care. So this is a really great question because a lot of us here see multiple providers. We have our general practitioner, our specialist, um, and it's helpful if all team members have 
one really good sense of what the goal is for you or your child. So you're working towards that goal together. Again, going back to comprehensive and collaborative care. If you get into an area where one provider is not willing to collaborate or doesn't necessarily agree, the best thing that you can do is request to have a consultation between the two providers so that they can really talk out what their process is. Um, here at the Johnson Center, we've done that before. We have been able to consult with other physicians to really help them understand why we recommend what we're recommending. Um, if that you are unable to create that communication, what you can do is send over your notes. So if you have your ABA notes, documentation, the data that's provided to you, therapy notes, therapy interventions, things like that, um, that could be helpful so that your provider really knows exactly what your child's goals are for ABA. If you're still met with resistance um, and you have clearly communicated that things like ABA or another intervention is really what is most effective for you, then really talk through what this looks like for ongoing treatment with a provider that is unwilling to support different interventions. Is that going to be something that they are unable to continue working with you on? Or is it something that if anything they recommend, is it going to be detrimental if you stop or started a different interventions such as ABA therapy. How does that really affect what that provider's plan is? Um, so it's really, it might just be having that really direct conversation with that provider. We are unfortunately out of time. Um, you guys asked some great questions. Thank you again for t attending today's webinar. Um, I did see quickly that someone asked about the website. I'm not sure if you were referring to the website that we have for child life support, um, but that is on our website at johnson-center.org. Um, if you want to refer back to any of the resources that we listed today, I do want to mention that you can find this webinar on our YouTube page later, later on so you can refer back to. I also want to briefly talk about an upcoming event that we have for any in the Austin area. On Saturday, April 21st, we will be hosting a teddy bear clinic. Um, we briefly talked about if um, your child has some anxiety or stress related to the appointment type or the type of procedures. A teddy bear clinic helps our kids become familiar with the type of procedures such as an x-ray or um, getting medication. And so we'll walk through all of those experiences in a very playful and therapeutic way. So if you know, if you have a child that has some anxiety or if you know of a family friend or another parent that has a child that has some anxiety, this is going to be a great opportunity for them. It's a free event located at our um, office um, at 1700 Rio Grande Street, free parking. So if you'd like to attend that event, event, you can follow us on Facebook to RSVP. Again, thank you for attending today's webinar. And um, if you need to refer back or if you have any additional questions, you can always contact us later on. Thank you.